Okay, so I think I'll get started. It's uh, 9 o'clock by this clock. Uh, so I'm going to continue with linear algebra today. And we'll uh, basically cover two topics. One is on representing systems of equations. And uh, there's a seat up here. And the second one would be on determinants. Uh, this should be relatively familiar material for you, for most of you. And uh, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. Um, this is really boring. Determinants is probably the most boring topic ever. <laughs> in Because uh, you do all this stuff and a lot of terminology and it's confusing. I find it confusing myself. And uh, you kind of wonder why. And the only reason why is because you'll need it for eigenvalues and things like that. And so that's the interesting part. And we'll get to eigenvalues uh, on Monday. But you'll have to go through de determinants before you can get to eigenvalues. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So anyway, so we'll do determinants. All right, let me start with the sy representing systems of equations. In many cases, it's possible to represent uh, a, a problem by a system of linear equations, something like, something like this. You know, I have some, I'm just going to use the example in the text. Uh, and there's a typo there, as somebody pointed out. It should be a x, not a z. 9x plus 0.5y plus 4z equals 0.9. OK. Um, so first, let me explain to you where, the, where do these equations come from. You know, when we talk about uh, systems of linear equations, we just say, well, here's some equations. You know, go solve them. But why? You know, why should we solve these equations in the first place? And it, uh, the reason is because in many, many cases, um, even though the system may not be maybe nonlinear, we can approximate it by a system of linear equations. And so, the, uh, so, and, and so there's this whole uh, field called linear optimization where we have not four or five or 10 equations, but we have 100,000 or 200,000 or a million equations and uh, you can, th there are three empty seats, one, two, and three. And then uh, when you have these million equations, you still need to solve them and come up with values that are consistent. And in optimization, you want to find values that maximize a certain objective function. I won't talk about optimization today, but I'm going to give you a kind of a, a hint of where one might come up with these uh, kinds of equations, uh, okay? So uh, a typical example uh, would be uh, scheduling. So let's take scheduling as an example. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, I'm just going to give you like a, th it's not in the books, I'm just going to just bear with me. What we're trying to do here is to figure out um, which classes should be assigned to which classrooms for, for a particular uh, term in the, in, in the, in the university, right? So, so we have over here uh, basically a bunch of classes and you have a bunch of classrooms. And we have a constraint on it, which is that, um, Every classroom should have only one class on it at any point in time, right? And we don't have two classes in the same thing. And every class must be at least in one classroom, okay, at least once a week. So quite naturally, we can represent, represent the set of uh, uh, classrooms that are available by, let's say, you know, this classroom one, x1, x2, et cetera, and xn are the n different uh, classrooms that are available. And now I have a bunch of uh, classes, you know, okay? And I'm just going to call these, uh, for example, y1 to yn. These are the m uh, classes. Hopefully m is, uh, well, we do, okay, let's not worry about that. So now I can start thinking about the fact that some classrooms should have uh, uh, no classroom. So what I'm going to do is these x values are basically going to be uh, 0 or 1. Okay, I'm trying to do this example on the fly, and maybe I'm not going to succeed, but we'll see what happens. Uh, X is the, uh, and we have a time slot, so we need to have that over here. So I'm going to basically take these classrooms, I'm going to multiply it by time. So let's say I have, uh, you know, in a week I have, let's say, 100 time slots. So we'll have something like this, you know, X1, comma 1 means 1 in the first time slot, classroom 1 in the second time slot. And if it's 0, it means it's not being occupied. Okay, 1 means it's occupied, right? So it's equal to one means, so at, at some time slot, I have some classroom being occupied or not. 
And then what I do is I represent uh, this with, uh, with, with these equations, which basically uh, say that all the classrooms, sum of all the classrooms in one time slot, okay, let's say x1 at some time slot uh, t, and we're going to sum over all the t. So this is basically the uh, uh, sum of all time slots across classroom one. So this is the number of times it's occupied in a particular week, okay? You can say this classroom should not be used more than five times a week, let's say. Then you should be, okay, it should be less than equal to five. So it has an inequality over here, okay? So I'm not going to go, to, going to go through the whole exercise, but I'm giving you just a flavor of how an equation like this expresses a constraint on a physical system. So if I say this room should not be used more than five times a week, I can express it in the form of a linear relationship like this because it sums of these variables are like that. Similarly, I can express these kinds of relationships. Every class must meet at least twice a week. Okay, so I can say sum over time, okay, of y, you know, let's say the ith class over the t is greater than or equal to two. So it should at least meet twice a week, maybe it should be three times a week. Okay, so these variables, which in this case over here have no particular meaning, get attributed to them meanings based on this. So once we have these kinds of things, we can see the number of variables grows very fast, okay? Similar kind of problem is, uh, is, uh, is the airline scheduling problem where I have the situation where a plane has to fly from some location to some other location and from there it has to wait some, some time, go to some other location and then fly back to the original location. So it has to go A, B, C, come back to this thing. So we can represent each plane basically by variable and then we start getting into systems of equations where you're trying to solve these equations. Most optimization, all optimization problems basically are systems of, or, or linear optimization problems are systems of equations which uh, have more than one solution. If there's only one solution, there's nothing to be done. So in fact, optimization is all about systems where we have many different solutions, you have to pick the best one. For now, we're going to just focus on systems of equations which have only one solution or we'll, we'll see what, it, what that means exactly in just a moment. But to deal with all of these equations, it turns out to be very useful to use matrices. Okay, so uh, one of the fundamental uses of matrices is to represent these very large numbers of equations. So we'll start by taking this one and just representing it as a matrix. So we, you know, when you study this in, in class seven or eight or whatever, you are just looking at these equations and trying to do something. The way to represent it as a matrix is uh, quite obvious. We put it like this, three, two, one, and then uh, minus eight, one, Four, I probably should, nine, zero point five, uh, four, and then we're going to just call this x one, x or x y z. Okay, is equal to, and the coefficient matrix is five minus two zero point nine, and this represents it in the form basically A is a matrix, x equals B, where x and B are our column. Uh, vectors, okay? So if you just remember how we did the matrix multiplication, you get exactly 3x plus 2y plus z equals 5, etc. So these equations over here become converted into this matrix form over here, okay? And that's basically the, uh, the notation. Now, the, uh, it turns out that once we have this form, we can do one more step, which is to just forget about this one over here. We kind of know implicitly that these are the variables involved. And so we can actually put the coefficient matrix into the main matrix itself in this form, three, two, uh, one. And then you can imagine this vertical line over here, five and minus eight, one, four, minus two, and then nine, zero point five, four, zero point nine. And this is the typical representation that we have of the uh, uh, system of equations, okay? So we've kind of skipped the step in between and just gone directly to that over there, okay? So any questions about that? Okay, so that's sort of the uh, easy part. So let's go on to the next step. So, oh, there's some, so there's some terminology that's related to this. Uh, this is called the coefficient matrix. Sorry. 
sorry, this is the left hand side of the coefficient matrix. Sorry. Okay. So this is the coefficient matrix. Because that's the coefficients of the uh, of the uh, variables, it's a coefficient matrix. And then the, this right, right hand side is, is called the constant. It usually doesn't have a name, you can call it the constants vector, or it's the vector of constants. If this is equal to the zero vector, then we say the system of equations is homogeneous. Homogeneous just means that the column vector over here is all zeros, or if you want, this column over here is all zeros, then we call it a homogeneous set of equations. And homogeneous equations will become very useful later on, but for now, we just, that's just a terminology. Okay, so let's remember how we uh, worked with the equations, you know, in, uh, when you were in school, and see how they convert into matrix, op matrix operations. So the first operation is that we know, for example, let's just take this one over here. We know that 3x plus 2y plus z equals 5. So we can certainly multiply both sides by, let's say, the constant 2, and therefore 6x plus 4y plus 2z should be equal to 10. I mean, it's just multiplying both sides by 2, okay? So that's obviously true. And therefore, the same thing should be true over here. I can take this matrix, and without any modification, I can multiply the row by factor 2, okay? So 3, 2, 1, 5 becomes 6, 4, 2, 10. And I claim that this is a valid operation. It's not changing the correctness. It's not changing anything, right? So that's uh, the first operation on the equation. And the e operation of the equation corresponds to operation on the row. And it's called the elementary row operation. Okay. That's just the, that's just the uh, uh, terminology we use for it, right? So if you can multiply any row by a constant, as long as you multiply every element by constant, it doesn't change the validity of that system of equations, okay? Now, the second thing we can do is the following. On the equation side, we can, we know that this is equal, so, you know, we can always add two, two things together, okay? We can add this equation to this equation because if this is equal to five and that's equal to 0.9, then the two of them together should be equal to 5.9. I mean, it kind of makes sense. So we can say that 12x plus 2.5y plus 5z equals 5.9, okay? So we can always sort of add equations, okay? That's what, you know, it just logically makes sense. Consequently, in this case, we can do the same thing. We can take any two rows and add it up. So, you know, I'm not going to go through that because it's obvious what to do. We just take any two rows. So we end up with two row operations. And the row operations are first to add, add two rows. And second thing is multiply a row by a scalar. And these are both okay. It's not going to change the solution. So that's straightforward. And once we do this, then we have a very powerful tool in our hands, which is uh, what's called Gaussian elimination. So let me just show you an idea how that works. Yeah. So I'm first going to give you sort of the intuition, and then I'll tell you how to do it. I'll actually solve this matrix, uh, go through that. So the way this, uh, yeah. You cannot change the order of the rows, correct. It is obviously because the equations have no intrinsic order, then you can switch the order. Uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, it's, yeah, I can probably, I should write that on. But I mean, that order, you can, you can reorder rows, I guess. But it's not a row operation per se. It's just, uh, please. In the textbooks that I consulted, it's not called a row operation. It's, it's just a thing you can do. It's not, it's not really, you're not really operating on the rows, you just, Switching them around. Okay. So what's the intuition? The intuition is like this. In a system of linear equations, it's always going to be the case. Let's just, uh, just, just focus on this set over here. Okay. And I'm going to take any pair of equations like this. If I can find some way to multiply this one by some scalar, right, 
and add it to this, I can get rid of one variable, let's say x. Okay, so if I take this one and multiply it by minus 3, I get minus 9. I add it over here. This x is going to go away. And now I'm going to be left with uh, two, uh, two equations. Sorry, with, with one equation, this equation only has y and z. And I can do this with the same with this over here. And then I get two equations in y and z. And then I do this thing again. Okay, and then I'm going to be left so just only with z. At that point, I substitute for z, I get a value, substitute for y, I get a value, substitute for x, and I get the value. I kind of work my way back up again. Okay. So the, the, uh, by recursion. Right? So let's take the simplest case. So uh, let's take just a very simple case. Let's say I have ax1 plus b, or sorry, ax1 plus bx2 plus cx3. Okay, equals, let's call this k1 for constant. And let's take two rows. Um, <laughs> I need a1, b1, c1, a2, x2 plus b2, a2, x1 plus b2, x2 plus c2, x3 equals k2. This could be any old equations. It must be the case that if I multiply x1 by a1 over a2, uh, sorry, a2 over a1, minus a2 over a1, I multiply this guy over here, that's going to give me a2x1, right? For as long as the matrix is OK, you know, these are not zeros and things like that, right? These are non-zeros. It's going to keep it nice. Then I just multiply this by minus a2 or a1, this by minus a2 or a1, add it up. I'm definitely going to get rid of the x1, OK? And then I have only equations in x2. So we can do this, essentially, uh, for any matrix. And that is the intuition behind Gaussian elimination. It's just kind of common sense. So let me work through an example. This is just going to use the solution over here. Um, and uh, so the, uh, what is the end result, by the way? The end result we want is something in the matrix that looks like this, 1 and then uh, some constant k. And then this variable over here is going to be the value I can just read off that particular value. So I'm going to do the, all the low, row operations. It's all going to be zeros. And then this is going to be 1, 1 left Okay, over here. And then I get this constant and just read off the value. That's what I want to get to. OK, so let's see how we can do that. So I have that matrix over there. And I'm going to uh, get to this thing over here. So we subtract. What is it? So here, subtract. So here's row, uh, this is row 3, this is row 2, and I have 4 over here and 4 over here. So if I subtract here from here, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to get a 0 right there. I don't need to do any multiplication. So if I do that, uh, then I get this matrix over here, 3, 2, 1, 5. I'll draw this vertical line over here, minus 17, 0 0.5, 0, because I got that 0 away, 2.9, and then 9. 0 0.5, 0 0.9. So if you, I can't see it from here, but I assume the thing is correct. So then I have to eliminate something else. So if I do 0 0.1 times, if, if I multiply this by 0 0.25 and, uh, and I subtract it, so minus 0 0.5 added to this row, what's going to happen is that this 4 is going to become a minus 1. And I add it over here, that's going to go away, right? So uh, then I get a matrix which is somewhat harder to write, but I'll persist, 0 0.75, 0 1.875, 0 0.47, sorry, 0 and 0.4775. And this is just, and then the rest is the same, minus 17, 0 0.50, 0, and just this last row is the same because I haven't really changed anything over there. But now what you see is that, uh, I've got two equations in two variables, right? And so I do the same thing all over again. I multiply the second row by uh, zero, uh, 3.75, et cetera. And basically, I'll get, a, I'll get this equation which says x equals, uh, or I should be, let me be more precise. I want to just write this down over here. We get the equation, we get this matrix, 64.5, 0, 0, 15.65. And then some other stuff at the bottom. Okay, and now I can see 64.5 times 
x1 equals 15.65, so x1 must be uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, 0 0.2426, okay? So we get that value right away. So this is what I want to get to. I want to get one variable with, uh, with, because I can always divide, by, I want to get a one number here and zeros over here. If we can get there, then we basically have a solution for x, and then we work backwards to get y, and we can get z. So that's, those are the two phases. In the first phase, we get to a row that looks like this. In the second phase, we're going to substitute backwards okay, and get this up. All right, so uh, in this uh, operation, what I've done so far, I've kind of ignored the uh, order in which I'm doing things. Okay. But if, you, if, you, if you're not careful, you can get into big trouble. And the reason you get into big trouble has got nothing to do with math and everything to do with computer science. Okay? And the reason is because in math, we kind of assume we can divide you know, any real A over B for us is whatever it is. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? It just doesn't matter. However, if A is uh, small, uh, uh, large and B is small, the ratio can be very, very large, right? So I just said multiply, you know, here it shows nice natural numbers, 3, 7, 2, multiplying point two five and things like that. What if A were 10 to the 5 and B were 10 to the minus 5? Then A or B is going to be 10 to the 10, okay? And 10 to the 10 is not something you can represent as an integer, you can represent as a floating point. Okay, if you represent as a floating point, then you only have a certain number of bits of precision left over there, which means you're going to have some error. And now you're going to start trying to subtract things, okay, and add things and multiply things. When you do that, this error is going to propagate, okay. And the entire field of numerical math is devoted to figuring out how to re reduce these errors, how to make sure that the errors don't keep propagating, okay. So for those of you who are doing simulations, for example, you will find that uh, you have errors coming in because you can't represent things accurately. You're always going to have some. And what you'll be careful about is to not lose the precision by not having enough digits of precision. So for example, here, when I did the solution, I found that the, uh, when you check the value, it, I, instead of getting 5 as the right-hand side, wherever this was going to is 5, I get 4.5. 9975, so it's 0.0025. That's when I did all the computations with eight digits of precision, okay? So is 4.9975 the same as five? Well, for practical purposes, maybe, maybe not. We don't know, right? So uh, in this exposition, it's I've kept it very simple, but in, in, in real life, you really have to worry about it. Thankfully, um, programs like MATLAB have figured out quite a bit of this, and so by the time you uh, use a standard program, you don't have to worry about exactly which row to choose, which element to multiply by. So this one over here is called the pivot element, what you're going to eliminate. And choosing pivots becomes very important, and that's what numerical uh, algebra people focus on. So the, the first solution is 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 0. 1 minus 3, 7. So I think I asked for the coefficient matrix, right? Yeah, it's this one over here. So I'd be really surprised if you got it wrong. Uh, the second one was basically we do uh, row 1 minus uh, 3 times row 3. So we have, the, this is one operation, and this is the other operation. One is the multiplication, one is the subtraction. Or if you, if you want multiplication by minus 3 and in addition, so that should be the answer for that. And then the other two I'll solve when I uh, talk about rank. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, okay. So let me continue on with the uh, rank, and then I'll do the rank of that system over here. So when we have a system of equations, one of the uh, obvious questions we want to ask is, is it uh, solvable? You know, does a solution even exist? And the other thing you can think of is, do too many solutions exist? You know, the infinite number of solutions. So let's just consider system equations where solution does not exist. Okay, so this would be the trivial kind of matrix, you know, one, 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 two. And you say, wait a minute. You know, you can't have that. You can't have xp1 and xp2 at the same time. 
uh, well, so a solution doesn't exist. You know, some, something is messed up. It's inconsistent. Okay. Uh, this is typically the input from a marketing to an engineering department in a company. So if you if you ever go to work in a company, marketing will say we want something like this and like that, and you put in an equation, say it's inconsistent, and the marketing says that's our prerogative because we are not engineers. You know, we are marketing people. So, <laughs> so well. That's what you get. A system like this is called overdetermined system. Okay, or, or inconsistent. Okay. Here's another system of equations. It's a very trivial system. It's x plus y equals one. So you say, okay, what value of x and what value of y? Uh, the infinite number of solutions. Right? It could be anything, right? X plus Y equals 1, if you think about it for a moment, is uh, basically uh, a line that goes like this, right? And so this is, you know, 1, uh, sorry, this is a 0, 1. That's 1, 0. And, you know, it's a 45 degree slope. Okay, it's a slope of minus 1. And every point is a solution. So it's an infinite number of solutions. So, you know, pick your answer. You know, anything that along this line is a valid solution. So we call this kind of system, which has this kind of property, we call it underdetermined. Okay. So given a set of equations, let's say a million equations, you want to come up with the uh, answer: Is it overdetermined? Is it underdetermined? Or is it has a unique solution? It's kind of an important thing to know when you have that many solutions. When you have something like this, it's trivial, but when you have, let's say, a million equations, it's not obvious. So to help us with this, uh, understand this, we use uh, the notion of a rank of a matrix. And I'll explain what the rank is in, in, in just a minute. But this is where the, it arose from. So I'm going to give you this matrix, okay? And what I'm going to do is I have over here, let's say, uh, n columns. This is the coefficient matrix. I have n columns, I have n coefficients. And so I need to do the n variables over here. Okay. And what I really want to do is to try and figure out whether uh, I can determine or assign unique values to all n variables. Okay. If it's if you can assign uh, if you cannot assign consistent values, it's overdetermined. If it cannot if I assign if I can if if I, if I have, can assign only to let's say uh, some of them, then whatever is left over is going to define something like this. Okay, so it will be underdetermined. Okay, so that's sort of the intuition behind behind the rank over here. Okay, so uh, let's kind of look at this with a. I'm going to I'll do an example to show you. Uh, okay, so I'll, let me actually start like this. So I have some matrix, which is the coefficient matrix. Uh, it doesn't have to be square, okay? It doesn't have to be square because I, in general, I have, I'm going to have, what am I using over here for the notation? So I have um, uh, M, so I have M equations. I have N variables. Okay? So when I have M equations, what I want to do is to figure out whether any of these equations over here can be represented as a linear combination of the other uh, rows over here. Remember, we had this notion of linear combinations. Okay, so let's say I have some row over here, and this can be expressed as a linear combination of, let's say, these two rows. Okay, so let's just call this row one. This is row two, and this is row three. If I can express the row, which means the vector, right? Row one is a vector. If I can express R one as, let's say, A times R two plus B times R three, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that I can multiply A times R2, that's an elementary row operation. I can add it to B times R3, that's another elementary row operation. So I get oh, this over here. And then I can subtract that from row one. I'm going to get this all zeros over here. I'm going to get all zeros. When I get all zeros in this row, like this, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way, what is the equation corresponding to? It's saying 0 times x1 plus 0 times x2 plus etc. 0 times xn, and remember I have this thing over here equals 0. It's not telling me anything. 
It's not giving me any information at all. It's just saying, if I multiply all the, co all the variables by zero, I get a zero. Well, sure, you know, that's a trivial kind of thing. It's not adding any value at all, right? So all rows, which can be reduced to the form this, zero times this row is equal zero, are essentially uh, redundant rows. They're not useful rows, okay? So we want to kind of figure out how many of these rows can I eliminate in this way? And the way I figure it out is to see how many rows can be expressed as linear combinations of the other rows. So remember what we talked about linear combinations. What we said was that we can take a set of vectors, we can view each of these as a vector, and we can say some subset of them, some subset of them are enough for us to derive all the others, okay? And that is what we call the linearly independent basis, right? So what I want to do is, given this uh, matrix, coefficient matrix, and, I, and actually I need to have the constant matrix over here as well. When I have this over here, uh, what I need to do is to say, okay, am I going to have uh, a linearly independent basis whose, uh, and, and let us say that the linearly independent basis has got k rows in it, where k is certainly going to be less than m. I can't have more than m, right? k is certainly going to be less than m. Then I can start figuring out that the number of actual equations I have is just m minus k. Okay? That's what I actually have. I'm giving you, let's say, a million equations, but you know, let's say half of them are, are, are redundant. Only half a million equations are actually useful, and that's going to be called m minus k, and I'll call that the rank. I'll denote that as r. It's the rank of the matrix. Okay? So the rank of the matrix is sort of the the useful part, all the rest is junk, okay? So that's basically the idea. Now, given the rank, we can now quickly determine whether the system is, is over-determined or under-determined or not, okay? So remember we have, we have n variables, okay? So we had three cases, the rank is less than n, rank is greater than n, or rank is equal to n, okay? Those are the only three cases that we can have. If the rank is less than n, what happens is that we have, we can solve only n minus r values, okay? We can get any n minus r, the remaining ones are going to be free floating, they can be whatever, okay? And so this system turns out to be underdetermined. Okay, it's underdetermined because we can choose whatever values we want for the remaining values. So in this earlier case, x plus y equals one, We, if you choose a value of x, then they're going to give you a corresponding value of y. You can generalize this. I can choose values for x1, x2, x3, and then the remaining values, you know, xk to x million, or x4 to x million are all determined, but I have three kind of free choices that I have. So then it's called underdetermined. If the rank is greater than n, it's overdetermined. It means it's inconsistent. Okay, we, we have more equations than we have or more equations than we have variables. You know, like I said, x equals one, x equals two. This is overdetermined. Okay, this this particular uh, system is going to have a rank of two, but it only has one variable, so we are out of luck. And if rank equals to n, then we have a unique solution. So the rank is important, and it's directly connected to the basis. Okay, so the basis of this set of vectors also corresponds to the rank of the matrix formed by those vectors. It's a, which is where I was explaining basis set, I, was, I accidentally used the word rank because these are actually, from the point of the matrices, are the same thing. You know, I can look at, view it either as the basis set or the dimension of the basis set, or I can view it as what is the rank of the matrix, okay? So, yeah. Uh, what if you have x plus y equals one and x plus y equals two? Well, x plus y equals x plus y equals two. Uh, this is going to be, uh, if you look at it this way, let's just write it like this, see what's going to happen here. You have one, one, two, one, 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 right? So this is going to become, if I do the row operation on this, it's going to become zero, zero, one, okay? And one, one, one. So this one over here is basically uh, wrong in some sense. I mean, I can't say, that zero times all the values is going to give me a one, right? So this is basically, uh, you could call it a 
wrong system. I mean, it's it's uh, in uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, incorrect, incorrect system of equations, right? But is it overdetermined or underdetermined? Uh, right? we, we, we typically.